so you know, the, one of the other things that comes up is in terms of the, uh, the charging capacity and yes. uh, where you know the, the plug is going to be. Will it be one plug? Will it be two plugs? A lot of people ask about that or the potential of charging it at a faster, you know, at a higher voltage. Right. Are you guys planning to incorporate any of those, uh, or how are you planning to deal with that? Or are you just going to make it one ten k? Well, we're looking at all the alternatives right now. One of the early decisions that we're making are really the number of charging ports, what's the best location on the vehicle. You know, on the concept car, we show two ports on either side yeah. near the front. Yeah. Uh, we need to evaluate, is that the most optimal from a human factor standpoint? And if people are going to be charging in the garage, is that the best way to do it? So we're not making the final decision yet. We've got a number of options that we're looking at. But that is one of the areas that we're making sure uh, that we take care of. Because we want to make it easy to operate. In addition, we are looking at other alternatives in the charging that will allow for faster charging. Okay. Because we do know that some people may have the capability or want to, if they want to put a special circuit in their house yeah. that's maybe 220 yeah. at a higher current level. And we want to give them the ability that if they want to do that, they have a way of charging the vehicle and get it done faster. Okay. So that's part of the detail that we have to work through in the vehicle. We're doing that right now as part of our engineering. Okay, that's terrific. Um, I guess another thing, you know, we're talking today about hydrogen fuel cells, and you're, of course, now in, in charge of the hydrogen fuel cell program for the Equinox and Eflex. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about the infrastructure, you know, not being here and the costs of producing hydrogen and the energy that has to go into that, and, you know, safety is uh, another thing that comes up. So, um, you know, how does General Motors plan to address that? I mean, if you can build this car that works on hydrogen, but there's no place to go to fill it up. How are you going to sell the car? Does it mean you're really serious about selling these cars? Or, or is General Motors going to help develop the infrastructure? What are the plans there? Well, first off, all I can say is General Motors is really serious. We're really serious about alternate energy or energy diversity. You know, the E-Flex is an example of looking at what can we have from diverse energy sources to power vehicles. So we take it very seriously uh, relative to the infrastructure of hydrogen. General Motors, though, is not responsible for developing infrastructure to provide hydrogen. We need partners to do that. I think what we're doing at General Motors is showing our commitment to a future zero emissions and renewable energy source by building these fuel cell equinoxes. We feel we have a responsibility to develop the technology on the vehicle side to be cost effective and safe and provide a vehicle that people enjoy driving that can use renewable fuels and be zero emissions capable. We need some partners to help us on the infrastructure side. Part of Project Driveway, we hope this one of the outputs will be people getting enthusiastic about the technology because the cars work great. And if we can get that enthusiasm, perhaps with policymakers and some of the opinion leaders in the country, we can get a little bit of weight behind the, getting the infrastructure going. It's not like hydrogen's a rare thing. You know, it's like 70% of the universe is made up of hydrogen. I guess it's getting it in the gaseous form on this planet. There are a lot of alternatives on how you can develop hydrogen and get hydrogen higher on the planet. You know, the primary way we do it right now is through reforming natural gas. And it's interesting, in one of the presentations one of our team members does that just a 2% increase in the amount of natural gas production here in the United States and that would be enough to fuel 10 million fuel cell vehicles. 2% isn't a lot. And the other thing that's beautiful about this, people are, I guess they either don't want to recognize it or like to argue about it. But when you look at the total perspective of getting the natural red gas out of the ground and actually using it inside the vehicle, the CO2 emissions are substantially less. Even converting natural gas to hydrogen, putting it in a fuel cell, the CO2 emissions are much less than people would have what they have in a conventional vehicle because there's no emissions out of the fuel cell. All of the CO2 is generated during the conversion to hydrogen. And at that point, it's much less than burning it. Okay. I guess another question, if I could, back about the battery again. You know, yep. we had talked before at, at, as October being the month when, you know, those guys, CPI, A123, Continental, were going to come and give you guys the first generation battery packs. Yep. That's what you guys were talking about. Are, are you at that point yet, or are you able to share that with us at all? I can't get into the details, but let me say it this way. Uh, we're on schedule right now. It's on the early development of the components. We actually have hardware that we're testing right now from our suppliers. So overall, I 
think we're pretty much on target with uh, what we've told people about the progress that we're making. Uh, we have our engineering development yeah, vehicles uh, for the whole program are already being built. We have some cars on the road for early development to look at the future. Oh, okay. That's very exciting. That's good. Yeah, another thing that comes up about batteries is, uh, and there's been some debate, other entities such as the Rocky Mountain Institute have given us some debate to this is, you know, how much energy is the car going to require to drive? So, for example, if you're using 8 kilowatt hours worth of battery energy to go 40 miles, then that means you're using 5, you know, 5 miles per kilowatt hour. And some people estimate that's too high, that's higher than Tesla, or... And we're, how do you respond to that? Is that a reasonable number, or maybe you can help put some of these questions to the rest? At the root of this is what's the overall efficiency of the vehicle. That's one of the things that we're addressing as we develop the engineering and the e-flex system in Chevy Bowl. You know, there's some key elements in the design of the vehicle that are critical for maximum efficiency. Things like aerodynamics, uh, the mass of the vehicle, how much electrical grain the vehicle has. Uh, also things like just rolling resistance on tires, a whole variety of things that you have to balance we're working aggressively on all of those elements as we develop the uh, E-Flex and Chevy Bowl. We're very aggressively going after the mass of the vehicle. Uh, we have teams in place that are working on the vehicles. And as we develop the design of the car, we're working with our design staff in aerodynamics. So we have some very aggressive aerodynamics targets that we can develop. So you, you certainly think that number is, is going to be doable? Well, we think we're going to be making some very good progress uh, as we go forward with this thing. We think we'll be able to achieve our goals. But again, we're still, you know, the big message with the E-Flex has been the 40 miles of electric battery on the driving range. As I said, we're very comfortable in meeting that. And there's a lot of work we have to do in the total vehicle to help us meet that, like the Arrow and 7. And then the other thing we hear a lot about is the, the uh, sort of cross-referenceability or the you know, sort of wide range of applications of the E-Flex system or structure. And can you share with us, things like, your, you know, are there plans to roll E-Flex into lots of different vehicles or performance vehicles or SUVs? Or what is General Motors thinking in terms of the future of this? Well, you know, certainly there's potential to do that, but I can't talk about future product plans. Right now, we've got a very uh, concise, tight program that we're working on. We are committed to getting this thing done in a timely manner once the batteries are ready. So at this point, we really can't look at the broad spectrum. We're really focusing with the laser to make sure we can do the program that we're committed to doing here at Terminal. But that does mean, doesn't mean that in the future, there won't be potential to apply in other vehicles. Okay. If I might have one more question. Sure. Um, you know, a few months back, uh, Bob Lutz was quoted as saying, and this was before the battery contracts were announced, uh, that he felt you were, uh, he was 90% confident that you guys would be able to pull this off by the end of 2010. Would you be able to say that number is any different now that several months have gone by? <laughs> well, since I'm pretty close to the program, I think 90% is probably pretty good. I'd say maybe a little bit higher than that. A little bit higher. I mean, yeah, I'm very confident. You know, the battery still remains a challenge, but a lot of the other systems on the vehicle are coming along very well. And we're going to continue focusing on the battery to make sure we can work with that. But we're going to make this happen. Thank you. Great. Lyle. Awesome. I appreciate it. Lyle Dennis, Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Hopefully that's one, thing, one thing you can